Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We have a special meta event this afternoon where uh, the NCSU Libraries Twitch team is meeting with the VTUL Libraries Twitch team, or some members of each team, not all of us could be here today, um, to discuss a lot of things about why are we here, what do we do on Twitch, what's coming up for the channels, what are the challenges, how do you brainstorm content, and a lot of things like that. Uh, I think we should probably start with a brief round of introductions. I'm Colin, I'm our experiential learning services librarian, and uh, I am working on this Twitch project, and I also work in our experiential spaces like the Makerspace, the Digital Media Lab, and the VR Studios. And I'll pick Claire to go next. Hi, I'm Claire. Um, I am an NCSU Libraries Fellow, and so um, a good portion of my work as a fellow is helping Colin run the Twitch program. Um, and I'll pass it off to Jonathan. Hi everyone, I'm Jonathan Bradley. I'm Head of Studios and Innovative Technologies for the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. Uh, that means I get to play with all the cool toys and um, make sure students and faculty and staff are getting support for experiential learning that they want. And a big part of that is now helping run the Switch stream and our content, but I definitely can't do that without Alice. Well, I'll let, pass it off to now. Okay. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Alice Rogers, manager of the Media Design Studios at Virginia Tech. This includes all of the technology lending and other things lending through um, what is currently known as Media Design Studio A, as well as a small recording space, Media Design Studio B, where you can come and record audio, video, and currently which houses some of our streaming equipment. Um, although we've been doing most of our streams for this past year for an obvious reason remotely. Um, but yeah, so I've, I've done a lot of production support work for the stream. Great. Well, to kick us off, uh, I think our first question is, can you tell us a little bit about the history of your channel and the, your core kinds of content and what makes, an well, and your team? And I'm asking, so I think you guys have to answer. Okay, well, we can start. So our our team um, is composed of mostly our studio managers, and we also have some friends from various other departments. Um, our special collections are common collaborators with us. Um, various members from there are very helpful with the channel. Um, the history of it, um, and Alice, correct me if my memory is wrong, because it's been all over the place this last year, is we were sitting in one of our studio managers meetings one day and one of our members, Max Offsa, who's been on our stream, goes, can we have a Twitch channel? He looked at me and I go, I don't know, maybe. And so I went and asked uh, my boss and like ran it up the administrative uh, hierarchy and was told like, yeah, go ahead, try it out, see how it goes. And then the pandemic hit. Um, and so we had to rethink all the plans that we had. Um, we had originally scheduled our first stream for uh, April 1st, um, 2020? 2020. 20, 2020. Uh, 20. Yeah. Um, and then pandemic hit. Uh, and we had to just delay it because we couldn't uh, be in person. Our library was literally shut down during that time. Um, and so at that point we started brainstorming, like how would we do this remotely? And um, we had some content we had planned. We wanted to do some live plays of role-playing games um, based on literature and one shots to sort of um, cohesively bring together this idea of storytelling and um, just creativity, because that's the thing we harp on a lot in our unit and department. And so we finally got sort of our logistics worked out for that fall semester. And our first live event was in October. It was actually during our first um, online game night that we also ran uh, in order to accommodate the pandemic um, in which we played Alice in Wonderland as a one shot. Um, since then, the channel's grown a little bit. We've expanded some of our content, which was always our hope was that it would turn into some places where we could showcase some of the just cool stuff that goes on in various places in the library. But we've got a streaming music um, program now that Alice runs, um, Archival Adventures, which is run by Anthony, 
um, from Special Collections in which he explores our archives and um, sort of picks really cool things that we have um, in Special Collections and talks about them. And we've got a few more things we've got plans for. We've had a few random streams. We played um, Walden, uh, a game over the course of the summer while our students were gone. Call that random, you know. <laughs> um, and we are hoping to keep expanding, I guess. Yeah, I should also mention uh, Kayla McNabb from Teaching and Learning Engagement has also been involved beyond mm -hmm. obviously special collections and the studios managers. Um, and yeah. she has also been involved in our production and uh, moderation support, um, as well as trying to work on creating documentation like learning objects for everything. Fun, yeah. fun fact, I did find the email uh, where you, it was the day it was right after the meeting and you're like I talked to Patrick already and he's cool with us doing this it was uh February 4th 2020 that we had started to talk about this I think we had probably made some jokes otherwise elsewhere um but you know that was that was where it yeah. all began I think it's been Max's dream to be a twitch star so I think he'd been pondering this for a while <laughs> Which is a shame because he hasn't been on the stream very much you know we've all been yeah. busy during the pandemic you know trying to make everything work and adjusting to new circumstances pretty constantly through today so um you know it's been a bit a bit of a ride for everyone but yeah i'm really happy with the expansion of content and uh did you mention kira's uh kira's also like for streams coming up in the fall kira's planning to do a did you mention the cocktails oh, okay yeah no i didn't mention that you should mention it you know oh, more yeah. about it than um, i do <laughs> Not too much more, but we are looking at potentially having a, I mean, we've been talking with lots of people in the library and, you know, want to expand out, make sure that people feel that they can uh, present content uh, on the Twitch stream that would be educational, that would be uh, playful and fun and contribute to sort of the environment on Twitch. Um, so I believe we will have a sort of podcast Twitch stream kind of combo deal that will be on cocktails and different uh, food things too because we have a pretty big food history collection at the library uh cookbooks and all of that and also a new food studies program at virginia tech so uh kira deets would be running that and hopefully that'll be shown up soon in the fall i'm very excited that sounds really exciting yeah so i, I we talked a lot as i suppose same question for y'all right uh history of your con content and channel uh I'll, I'll start. So we, uh, if you were to, if I were to search my email and find the first time we talked about making a Twitch channel, it would not be in February of 2020. It was, ours is much more of a response to shifting conditions due to a global pandemic. Um, in, let's say, June, uh, after we had hired Claire and before Claire had started, uh, we realized we had the opportunity to shape half of what her fellows was going to be in order to engage with experiential learning in a remote environment in a way that the libraries hadn't done before. And immediately what came to mind was live streaming. Um, as with everyone, things closed during the pandemic and our experiential learning spaces like our makerspace, our digital media labs, our VR studio or 3D scanning studio, all these spaces we could not allow people into safely. And so we closed them. Um, the libraries themselves reopened in early July, but those spaces remained closed. So we were looking at the opportunity we saw there, both because we wanted to find a way to share these spaces and to share the expertise of the students who work in those spaces, but also we have a great cohort of student workers in each of these spaces who we wanted to be able to continue to pay. Uh, we wanted to give them a cool and meaningful job, and they happen to just have the right skill set to do this kind of work. You know, the students who are in our digital media labs, who are in VR and who are in Makerspace are already pretty entrepreneurial. They're very experimental. They're willing to jump into something and learn it on their way down to the ground. It's really exciting um, to see the kinds of stuff that they teach themselves on stream and Twitch really makes it easy to have that kind of amateur, um, non-professional, non-high production quality sort of presentation. Um, Claire, do you want to talk about our kinds of content and our team? 
Sure. Um, I, I'll definitely second how amazing our student team is, because I'm going to start with them. But um, And a shout out to our student moderator in the chat, hello, um, in the NC State chat. Um, and um, thanks for gathering questions and doing what you do so well. So we'll start with that, the student content. We had a lot of student-driven um, streams from those spaces that Colin mentioned, and really that's um, just showing off what we can do in those spaces, the great people that work there, the kinds of equipment we have, and they're decided on by the students, so it's um, so that they're made for other students who are interested in those spaces. So um, I think that the main purpose of those was to show that even if our spaces are closed, the physical space, the, um, our experiential learning kept going, and, and some of these things, we still had the 3D printing service, and, and there were a lot of things you could still do with the spaces, even if you couldn't be there in person. And that's something that we hope continues even after the spaces are open. Even if you can't be there physically in person, or you aren't there yet, there's still lots of ways to, to engage with that. Um, so yeah, we had some interesting stuff, some VR illustration, just some fun VR games, and um, some makerspace stuff making all kinds of different things, and we added on the Digital Media Lab to, to do some editing. Um, so that's half of what we do. The other half are collaborations, so really reaching out and getting other interesting people to come onto our channel. And um, that started, I think, our, our pilot in the fall was mostly with people who worked with us in the libraries, just showing off either what they do at work or what they do outside of work. Um, and putting on something, some kind of interesting demonstration for people to watch on Twitch. And that really expanded in the spring, and we started reaching out to um, student groups, some clubs that worked with us that we're really hoping to keep going in the fall. Um, and we're starting to work with some, some campus communities and, and campus centers too. So that's been really fun, having some of those big events where people come in, we have collaborators on, that's been interesting too. Um, and yeah, so we're looking at the fall and how that looks different. If Part of the reason why we started is very different. Um, that means that our channel can be a little bit different, and that's exciting. Yeah, definitely. I'll just add that we have a, a large group of people working on this. Um, we have our student employees who have been fantastic. We have the supervisors of those employees who previously had nothing to do with Twitch, who also now have to know a lot about Twitch. We have um, other service owners in our department, Learning Spaces and Services Department, folks like Jason evans Groth, who um, supervises the DML students and kind of our digital media lab um, efforts, and Alex Valencia, who's our student success librarian, plays a large role in those collaborations, bringing other people into um, into the channel and having the channel serve as a platform for their work. And just a lot of other folks have been on the channel, presented the things that they do and what makes their work interesting. Sounds, it sounds fascinating um, to see y'all's trajectory when you sort of started for different reasons than we did. Um, and how we've come to pretty similar places, I think, at the end, which might lead to the next question we sort of had on the docket of what makes an academic Twitch channel different. So I asked first this time, so y'all have to answer first. <laughs> I'll say one of the big differences is the number of people doing it. Most Twitch channels are a win, one person in one setup. Maybe occasionally they'll also Twitch stream from their phone or something like that, where we have, I don't even remember the total number of people who have broadcast on a channel. It's like in the 30s? I, I think that's that right? 50 now. Um, I okay. was just pulling together the numbers the other day. So 50 plus people have been on our channel um, with some level of setup required for each of them. Uh, sometimes it's as simple as joining a Zoom call, and some of them are much more complicated, like you're going to perform on the loading dock at Hunt Library when everything is closed, and we're going to record that, but then you're also going to be in the chat when we play that live on our channel later. Like, it's just a lot of, there's a lot of steps involved in doing lots of different kinds of content with lots of different folks. And I think that's one thing that really makes it different for um, our kind of a Twitch channel. For a moment, I thought you were saying like 50 people had streamed directly like through like OBS to your channel. And I was like, how have you kept your stream key private this whole time? 
How have you protected that? Uh, well, we do change it a lot, even um, even oh, as okay. it is. But um, yeah, not not quite fifty people logging it, and on every single one of these, we're we're working on you know supporting them. I think a lot of people, um, especially guests, can be intimidated by the technology side of things, and we do our best to say, all you have to do is show up and do your thing, and we will do all of the Twitch stuff. So um, that also, I mean makes it easier for everyone and yeah if we're talking about security that makes it a little easier too um i would say one of the other differences um for academic twitch channels is just that twitch itself is not really built to be an academic tool um there's a lot of features that are features for twitch streamers that aren't necessarily features for academic channels um and um yeah i mean colin you hit the big one with there's lots of different people on the same channel but just a lot of little things that are geared toward individuals or people trying to um, use this to make money and a lot of things that don't necessarily apply to us. But um, what, have, what have you all noticed? Uh, on, that, on that front, like Twitch just isn't really seen geared towards like academia in general because like the sort of communicative channels that we're used to using in academia for getting support and things just are not how Twitch does it, which is pretty common among like big tech right now is um, it's just really hard to get a hold of a person. Um, and so that always makes things challenging when you're you're dealing with your your individual university like ecosystem and all the things that you need answers to and who, how you need those answers to arrive. And that's that's definitely rough. I think content is part of it too. Um, thinking about content and we've always sort of been like, you know, how are we tying this to some sort of like goal that is, you know, it's educational goal or at the very least something tied to the work that we do and making sure that it is in line with that because, you know, it's, you blur the line to a certain degree. There's always that, like, how much fun am I having? And and is someone going to accuse me of not doing work anymore? And that is one of the nice things about working in like the studios and the similar environments that y'all have is that like, you get to have fun. And that's like part of your job. These spaces are fun and intended to be fun. But like, is there still, or, you know, and we think about that in the physical spaces as well, too, is like, is there still something that we're learning from this or that is some sort of academic gain that meets some sort of academic goal. It doesn't necessarily have to be like, I learned a skill, but did I have an experience that might benefit me in the future or something along those lines? Um, and making sure that we're always meeting that um, and that the content we're planning is always meeting that uh, is, is an interesting challenge. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a component of things that we think through for our content is just making sure that there's always yeah, that element. And even like having scrolled through, like, for instance, like the educational tag on Twitch, you know, um, different people can have like different uh, takes on what that means. Uh, like, so for instance, like teaching people how to play a video game, which is, is still, edu it's absolutely educational and absolutely useful. But in terms of like the goals that we have to consider, not only like just generally goals that we have, also the goals of Virginia Tech and Virginia Tech libraries. And so, um, you know, while teaching people how to play a video game may be an educational goal, generally we need to think of goals that the university is going to care about more broadly. And so, um, you know, that's led us to a couple of different paths through content that's typically on Twitch, which includes like obviously um, like live live action, uh, actual play, like tabletop role playing games, which is our one of our main pieces of content. But also like, you know, kind of the talk show realm and the talking, uh, just chatting realm, as well as uh, various uh, tutorials or like people working through projects, uh, certainly in music. Um, but I'm sure we'll get more into the makers area in the very near future as well, which y'all have kind of been in for a while. And so there's a lot of people still making content in there in those categories and the our, our stuff fits with that sort of, but there are some you know overarching goals that we have to keep in mind um, to make it to make it viable i would say another challenge is the difference between being in academia and the things that we do and how they're done on twitch like one of the things that we've had i had to explain to myself and also have had to explain to others is like coming on twitch and just doing like a workshop 
isn't necessarily what people, the audience of Twitch expects. Like they expect like direct interaction. They'd rather watch a professional work and do something and learn from seeing this, um, you know, person doing a job that they may want to do someday than sort of sit and listen to a lecture or, or, or even this sort of more structured, formalized teaching that, I mean, at least I'm more familiar with. And so, and I like that. I like that it's freeing and that you can just sort of have that moment to like talk with people and just do something and, and the knowledge that they're learning something from it without all of this planning. Like the, there's like a anti-planning almost that we've had to adopt mentally uh, in certain degrees that has been challenging for some of us who are come from academic backgrounds where lesson plans and all this workshop learning like objectives, outlines you know, and like learning outcomes. objectives and all, and all that sort of stuff is a very active part of what you do from day to day and sort of throwing that out the window and being like, I'm going to do something and I'm going to talk with people and we're going to see what what they take from it, what they want to know. I think that connects with um, one of the things we talked about recently with the end of the year reporting is, is Twitch instruction? Is it reference? Is it just a normal working shift for a student worker, which might not count for either of those things? Discuss. And like, we can't, uh, so yes is really the only answer we have is sometimes one and sometimes the other and sometimes neither of those things and it depends on who's doing it and what they're doing it for and what they're presenting and that makes it really hard to uh, count those things at the end of the year, um, especially if you rely only on Twitch's internal tools, because uh, they evaporate into the ether after a certain yeah. amount of time. Another another reason why it's not geared towards academia is its ephemeralness. Um, yeah. So I can say from our reporting, because I also just got done doing a bunch of annual reporting, most of our stuff was reported as events. Um, and there was a handful of things that were considered workshops because there was an explicit, like, we're going to teach you how to do this. And then there were a handful of things that were in our system. We have a thing called non-instructional presentation, and those are usually treated more like conference presentations, or if you go to talk with a group about services that you have. And so there's, there's some sort of impact or value for the university as a whole for you doing that. Um, so some of the stuff counted as that when we weren't sort of explicitly teaching, but we were was also not like all of our like role of play sessions counted as sort of events and that's how we have treated them. Um, but some of the other stuff fell into those categories, but I agree with you. It was hard. I definitely like would go in and put some of the stuff in. I'd be like, I don't know. Um, and, and then counting, it was also a challenge. And I don't know if y'all ran into this, but like when we input stuff in our like data reporting and do all our metrics, like I pull the numbers that we get from Twitch from the event, but when the event ends, that's not the end of its life on Twitch. And a lot of our videos have gotten far, far more views in the weeks following them, them actually being live than they did during the event. And so like going back and trying to track all this stuff and having a good sense of like, and then the video disappears after two weeks, which takes its metrics away with it. And even if you highlight it, the highlighted video gets a new set of metrics that aren't indicative of the old set. It, it can be a mess to try to really quantify this work in a way that, you know, we're used to counting metrics for an academic project. One of the challenges we ran into that's related to that is, um, and also related to, usually these are individuals, is, is that if we did two streams back to back, for example, run from four to six o'clock and then from six to eight o'clock, it saw that as one entire stream. So it only counted from four o'clock to eight o'clock, four hours of streaming, assuming that everything's the same and that it won't matter to you. When really those two blocks of time were completely different and, um, you know, had different themes, different people, and we wanted to count them very separately. And that was a, a challenge when we downloaded, you know, um, as much data as we could from Twitch to try and report that and to, to show how our channel's been doing, is that it it was difficult to separate those without either having somebody do it by hand, and, and eventually we started doing it programmatically, but even that requires 
having the data in a stable format so that you can enter it into the program and have, have that script work properly. And that um, it just wasn't as, um, wasn't as uniform as I think I'm used to our assessment data being. Actually, we're kind of on to the question of what are the challenges of setting up a Twitch channel already? Um, because I also wanted about this. No good to just go point out, interrupt. The moderator, our valiant moderator, has yeah. chatted a set of questions for us to entertain mm. as well. And those are coming mm. later. We can just jump to them now. We can jump to um, them now. Yeah. Yeah. How do you feel your respective channels have evolved over time? And are there major differences between your current upcoming streams and the streams from your early days? Yeah. <laughs> so our first, our very first stream was pre recorded because we did not know how a live actual play was going to go with people who had never really streamed a live actual play before. We also were still getting hand, uh, handle on the logistics of streaming. Then our first few streams were over Zoom, and we ran into a lot of audio and video issues, desyncing. Um, if people would drop out, it would mess around the layouts and stuff that we had and, and move people around. Um, and we've really got a much, we didn't have any documentation for people who were setting things up. So Alice was like meeting with them, like for some period before the stream to just, just get them set up with everything they needed. Um, and we've since made documentation. It's a lot smoother and there are still things that we want to improve, but documentation oh, still needs to be improved. But yeah, it's it's better than it was. There yeah. is some there is an amount of documentation, um, and I like as uh, I, I, we may have not talked about it yet. I mean, we're hoping to do some in person streams in the fall, and so everything's going to change yet again um, because we're going to need to be able to move all the equipment around to different locations in the library to stream for different like events and things, and so um, yeah, we'll need to recreate documentation for all of that so it's just like another the next layer above yeah. so i'm very I, go ahead <laughs> i'm excited about that though like, i am too absolutely well so even beyond just being in person which i think will be fun like one of my biggest frustrations with the whole thing was remotely dealing with the problems and doing this stuff remotely because like you know if we're sitting in a room together and the audio is not working for microphone b or something then i can go look at the cables for microphone b i can go look at the mixer i can go look at something and i can test it and i can say all right we're going to plug a different cable in when someone's like i keep dropping out i can't i'm not an isp i can't go like check their internet and see what their bandwidth is or anything so i mean you feel helpless to a certain degree and I'm I'm looking forward to troubleshooting things in that, that physical realm a little more and having a little bit more agency with that because that has been one of the bigger difficulties is just people's internet access and um, you know consistency and and getting weird so software glitches taken care of on people's unique computers and dealing with people's unique computers and I have a Mac I have a PC I have my Mac's fuck ten years old and my you know, my PC is brand new and all this sort of stuff and, and trying to figure out all those logistics and being able to sort of put some of those things aside and say, we got a pretty consistent setup here and we have a set of things that we're likely to have to troubleshoot. Yeah. I think one of the biggest uh, evolutions of our channel, I think Claire already mentioned this some, is that the percentage of content that is kind of our core content versus guest content has shifted dramatically. Uh, when we started, let's say, at the peak of spring, not when we started, but at the peak of spring last semester, we were doing something like nine or 10 core contents a week to one or two guest streams a week. And now in the fall, we're looking at doing something that's a lot closer to even. Um, there'll still be more core content, but it'll be a lot uh, closer. And I think that that's um, not what we originally envisioned and also really pays off uh, if for no other reason, it gives a lot of variety to the channel and there's a lot of interesting stuff that we do. And I'm constantly uh, surprised by our colleagues in the library and our colleagues across campus with all their varied interests and abilities and the things that they're willing to just like put themselves out there on the internet doing. I just, I, I'm so impressed. 
um, a really in the weeds thing that has evolved for us also is back to that instruction reference difference we were talking about for um, just assessment purposes. Is that when we started, when we were imagining what the channel would be and what our core content would be, we thought it would be a student staffing Twitch, much like they would staff a physical space and, you know, maybe making something if they work in the makerspace, but mostly answering reference questions and talking to people in the chat. And ultimately that has been completely switched. Now they are mostly making and showing things and sometimes answering questions in the chat um, as people have them. And um, I think we overestimated how much of a chat reference service Twitch could be when really that's not what it's for. It's not what people want to use it for. And we found out it just doesn't work very well for that. It works better and it naturally became what it is now, which is just watching people do interesting stuff. That is one of the fun things about Twitch, just watching interesting stuff happen. Um. I'm, I'm always amazed too and I think about it as like what could we do in this realm of like the channels that are just like 24 hour streams of something like we we raid the Monterey Bay Aquarium a lot and I'm just like man this is a great gig they just got these like jellyfish up here <laughs> just 20 24 7 you just can pop on there and see what they're doing um so that's that's also been the the variety of content on Twitch it's there's a place for everything and that is, it's just finding how to talk about it and, and how to do it in the way that the Twitch audience will respond. I think we should have 24 seven live 3D printer camera. Yeah. Um, we we, we could just that. get the frame rate to work right. Yeah. We've talked about that and putting up 24 hour 3D printers and stuff when we're not streaming, just have them going all the time. Um, and it's a lot of plastic. Can't, yeah, see a lot of yes. little disasters probably. <laughs> yeah. I think we people would enjoy that though. Yeah, I mean you could you could outsource that though. Just have people like post some sort of macro in the chat whenever the print starts failing. <laughs> Sends a message to the manager that's like, "Oh, our print's failing. We should go in there and check on it." Getting pings in Discord. Right. Yeah. Constantly. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about that, obviously, some of the questions uh, are related to what you raised earlier, where, you know, numerics may be a little funky for something like that, when typically you have a little bit more, you know, curated content, um, and then that can kind of adjust some things, um, especially, it just depends on, you know, ultimately how we're trying to measure that. Um, I'll be curious to see how we're able to do so. Um, but yeah, no, I feel like that could be a lot of fun and would, again, fit in with a lot, of, fit in both with like what we're trying to do as a library and promoting these services that we have available to anyone, as well as what is common on Twitch and what people like to watch and what people like to have on in the background. Um, especially if we had like, I don't know, not, not the 3D printer sound and some like soothing, chill music in the background that's just on repeat or something instead. I think that would go over better. Well, I really would love to figure out some way to make stuff like that interactive. Because like yeah. one of the channels, when I when I first, we were first considering being on Twitch, I was Googling through some channels on Twitch that were in like the education sphere. And I found one that's just, it's a, a bunch of cameras on a pond with some ducks. And um, it's like a 24 hour stream and you're just watching these ducks, but there are little feeding things. And if you um, put certain stuff in the chat, it will drop food out for them. And there was a message when I was on there that was like, the food's empty, like can't feed the ducks anymore. <laughs> um, wait until it gets refilled like the next day. But I've been pondering that of like, how could we, if, if we were gonna do some sort of like 24 hour stream of one of the spaces, how could we make that something that people could interact with and genuinely come to do something there without also trolling it? Cause that's the other side of it is like, you gotta, you gotta put a limit on how much bread's in the dispenser or else you're gonna end up with really fat ducks. Um, yeah. <laughs> people are just going to keep feeding them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know we had talked about like being able to maybe change the lighting, especially if these things were sort of run overnight, um, where like people are not, and especially in the rooms that are kind of separated with the machines, like change the lighting color or drop a disco ball down would be way more fun than just changing the lighting color. But that's maybe a little bit more, a little bit more stuff. But yeah, 
obviously making sure nothing breaks is key. It's all Arduino, right? Like you can yeah. you can make any of these things happen if you have enough Arduino. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so speaking of anything other than Arduinos, um, do you guys have like a recommendation for a thing to get started with? If you are a public library or a uh, academic library that wants to start a Twitch channel, what do you say? Go get this, this, and this, as opposed to an Arduino, because don't don't start with Arduino. So is this for like starting a Twitch channel or just like doing fun stuff as a library? Starting a Twitch channel. Starting a Twitch channel. It's a little dependent uh, on what you're trying to record for sure. I mean, I would argue do some sort of art. There are so many amazing, successful people on Twitch doing art. And even the people who aren't like amazing artists still usually have people who are interested in what they're doing. Um, and so that's the fascinating part of it for me is like people just really want to watch others create and and be able to talk to them about what they're creating and why they're doing it. And, and you know, if you're watching someone who's a professional, is really talented, then you might learn something from them for your own art. But even if you're not trying to make something yourself, you get to see this part of a process that for a long time has been sort of hidden from people. Um, and so that's sort of that really low barrier. Cause I mean, you can just go get some paint and a canvas or something and and, a, and a, just, for that like technology wise you need like a doc cam like a doc cam can do all kinds of cool you can do so many different things you can show your collections you can um yeah do art you can do all kinds of different things and a doc cam is like doc and again if you wanted to like show yourself too you could also have a webcam um and so like those two get you get you started at least right um you know, showcasing items and mm -hmm. should be fairly simple to set up in something like OBS. When you say what? fairly simple to set up and then you said OBS, I was like, asterisk. Yeah. yeah, it's fairly simple for what you'd be doing. OBS is definitely clunky and a little complicated. And, you know, if you're used to working with uh, video software, it's not too terribly bad. But if you're not used to it, definitely you know, take a little crash course. And there is, uh, the thing is, uh, despite the fact that we do a number of things differently from, you know, your average streamer, there's still, because so many people want to get into streaming, there's a lot of really good documentation online for how to get OBS set up and working relatively well, depending on your circumstances. Um, so I think that that's, um, that's always, you know, useful. And obviously OBS is open source and free. So that's a, you know, it is a resource in that way. <laughs> I think one thing that is more important than it seems at first is audio quality. Yes. Um, and it's also fairly inexpensive to get something that sounds better than your laptop microphone. Um, I think three out of four of us here have a blue Yeti microphone within reach of where we're sitting. Um, not because it's the only option, but it's a good one. And there's a bunch of USB condenser mics that would be a good early purchase as well. They're kind of bulky. They do take up space. You either want to arm or the platform or whatever stand to go with it. But it makes a big difference in the audio. Yeah. yeah. There was a there was a survey and Alice, you were telling me about it and I don't remember where it was at, but it was a survey of like viewers of live streams. And they were saying that they'll stop watching a stream because of poor audio long before they'll stop watching a stream because of poor video. Uh, yeah, one time I was accidentally streaming at 540p on the music stream. That's a fun fact uh, because I was set up for the tabletop streams where I'd send out a lower signal. And I was, I realized later I had like great viewership that time. We had a bunch of people who hadn't heard. They're like, what's Virginia Tech University Libraries? Like, and I was like, well, let me tell you about Virginia Tech University Libraries. Like it was one of those things. Um, but yeah, I had been streaming at 540p, but I was using a relatively nice microphone, obviously. And so, um, you know, that is absolutely a huge deal. Even, even if like, you know, you just get an external, you know, um, like a Logitech webcam, those have a microphone in them that is better than the one that you have in your computer, usually not always, but the fact that it's further away from your fan is going to give you some, some buffs for sure. But yeah, 
Um, even like the Blue Snowball, which I think is one of the most least expensive kind of condenser microphones out there. I want to say it's like in the $50 range. Um, sounds great. Really, really useful. Yeah. I don't know if I told you, Jonathan, that I was streaming at 540p one time. You probably noticed, though, maybe, or maybe not. Uh, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> it was funny that no one said, hey, quality is a little low here. No one said anything. Um, uh, well, I mean, the Twitch audience is very forgiving. That's the thing that I've noticed is just like if you got technical difficulties, if things aren't going right, for the most part, people are like, yeah, it's a live event that happens. And often people will also tell you if things are like not quite right too, which is kind of very kind. Like, hey, it sounds like your your mic's a little soft. You can be like, thank you, because I don't like, you know, it's, it's hard to test yourself um, while you're playing, especially if you have something like your desktop audio is being sent um, to the stream. Like you don't want to listen to the stream on your computer to test it. So um, yeah, people are really pretty kind about that sort of thing and helpful. Um, for getting that fixed up. It's very nice. But if we are on the topic of like a library starting their own channel, think about your moderation. Uh, think about setting up a bot or having someone dedicated to do that, or at least having some rules set up on your channel. Um, Cause I mean like spam bots are all over the place on Twitch. And if you're just not quite paying attention and nobody's looking at it, they'll just fill your chat full of links. And most of the bots you can find online that are free will be able to get rid of those instantly. And so you don't have to worry about them too much. Uh, we use MooBot on ours. Yes, that's what we've been using, right? Yes. I, I don't know anymore. Yeah. Y'all took care of that. I appreciate your hard work. <laughs> I think yeah. we have Nightbot. Those and are, then we I also think... have student moderators. Whenever we're live, we, we do have someone, an active person in the chat as well. Yeah, moderate. Yeah, shout out to the moderators. We usually have someone doing moderation as well, um, but oftentimes it's either the producer or uh, just uh, another staff person. But we'll hopefully have some more student moderators too in the fall. Also doing clipping because uh, one of the things. This is just a side side thing. This is going back to an earlier question about challenges of setting up a Twitch channel. Uh, getting an audience to know that you have a Twitch channel, that your Twitch channel exists, is really, really challenging. Um, getting the word out, social media is very challenging to use in terms of like Instagram or Twitter, getting people to come to your Twitch channel. And of course, as, as university libraries, our main pathway is being like official, like Virginia Tech library, Twitter or Instagram or Facebook. Um, you know, they're, they're sending out messages about a lot of different things. And so like the say, saying, hey, we're going to be live at this time can kind of get filtered out in the mess. And depending on the uh, news feed production of the various platforms, people may get that information way after your stream is done. So, um, you know, one of the things that we are hoping to do is, uh, and we've been, you know, advised by a student from Virginia Tech who had had a successful Twitch stream, um, was to create content or like segments of your content for other platforms that then will point people back to your Twitch channel. So um, we're working on having like video clips. You know, we have these three hour tabletop role playing game streams, maybe a few short one minute TikToks, or maybe a 10 minute compilation of the best moments from that stream. So people can get an idea of what they're like and it's more findable, um, more discoverable. That's a librarian word. I'm not a real librarian, by the way, everyone. Hi. Um, <laughs> more discoverable on a number of other platforms like YouTube, like even um, usually YouTube is definitely one where people search for content by like tags and you can find it compared to Twitch. If you don't type the exact name of the streamer you're looking for, you'll never find them. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's uh, that's a challenge that we've been dealing with. I, I think, one of the by things. the way, the using the word discoverable in a sentence confers you an honorary degree and you should come oh, yeah. expect it in the mail shortly. Oh, it'd be great. Excellent. Love that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that was one of the things that student had really hit on that we grabbed a hold of was that um, she was saying in her time, like building her channel on Twitch, she had found that the algorithm on Twitch is 
really not that great. It points to things that are popular. It doesn't really do anything to understand what you like to watch. And so she said most of her and all the streamer friends that she has that have successful channels have had to rely on other platforms who have algorithms like YouTube that will actually try to figure out what you like to watch and point you to that content and then pass those viewers over to Twitch versus relying solely on Twitch to get, get you in front of people who might like your content. We've, um, I, we've worked with a, a lot of those same problems, getting people to find out about our channel, and we've had some pretty good success just with events and collaborations, bringing people in. Um, you know, if you have a representative from a club that comes in, then they'll tell the rest of their club to watch that one stream, and if they're interested, then we tend to get more followers from those collaborations or those larger events, just because all of a sudden they realize that we exist and sometimes they're interested in coming back and seeing more. Yeah, I think one of our most watched streams and most active chats. <laughs> I know exactly a, what you're talking about. <laughs> we had a teacher from the local school system be on the, on the live play. And so his students showed up because they wanted to watch him play a role playing game and they were all over that chat it was it was uh, a lot of fun chaos um but that was, that so was fun. it was yeah that sounds pretty terrifying <laughs> as a teacher you know yeah. having like you, you, 20, 20 high school students really separate like really <laughs> far apart from each other i think he invited them mm -hmm. He did. He, he told them about yeah. it. Well, yeah. He knew they were coming, at least. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think he wanted them. I think he wanted them to be there. I, I think he was really engaged. I think he wants them to be engaged with the, the that sort of content. So I don't think it was a surprise for him at all. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's, it is always good to show students, especially high school students, that, you know, learning can be fun. You know, it's not, it's not all about just getting through those AP exams and, uh, you know, um, what are the uh, standards of learning here in Virginia, the standardized tests that all the students have to kind of run through, um, that there are other things to learn and other ways to learn, and, you know, encouraging them to engage with those. I think we've talked a lot about the challenges and perhaps some of the drawbacks of Twitch. So maybe now's a good time to move on to the question of why do we pick Twitch? Why are we doing this here? As opposed to Instagram Live, YouTube, or Facebook, or any of those other platforms. And, and this time I'm going to ask Claire to go first because I've been asking all the questions. Um, I, I mean, why did we choose Twitch? I would say the biggest reason is because the chat is anonymous, um, which of course has benefits and drawbacks. Um, and like we said, moderation is really important if you don't have any way to hold people accountable to what they say in the chat. But um, I, we wanted to give people a space to not be tied to their school selves or their work selves, or um, that's especially relevant for NC State because we're a Google campus. So if we use something like YouTube Live, there's a good chance that students would be logging in and interacting with us using their school account. And there's, um, I mean, I don't think they're embarrassing, but sometimes people are embarrassed by complete beginner questions. And that's why we're there. So we wanted to make it as comfortable as possible for people to come in and um, put all of their questions and concerns and interests in the chat um, within reason, of course. And I think from there, we just decided to um, go with Twitch and see how it went. And after about a year, almost a year, we were just talking about that, um, I think we're looking into becoming a little bit more, or a little bit less platform dependent. Um, we want to make content that would work on any kind of streaming platform. And so we're looking into how we can um, use YouTube. I think you all have been using YouTube to store your videos and things like that, how we can make something that works in a lot of different places. But that that's why we started on Twitch. Am I missing anything, Colin? Because technically you came up with the idea before I started. Uh, I think the only thing I'll add is we picked Twitch based on our intended audience. Um, it really depends on who you're trying to reach. Uh, we were, our primary audience is undergraduate students at NC State. 
And then our secondary audience is graduate students at NC State, and then faculty, and then alumni, and then people who have nothing to do with NC State, right? Like those are kind of the circles of our audience. And given that, we pick Twitch because the is the one that's going to be most popular with undergraduate students. Um, if our goal was to reach alumni, we would pick Instagram or Twitter, not Twitter, sorry, um, Facebook probably. Those are a little bit more institutional. They're going to be checking on their alma mater and follow, find us that way. But because we wanted to reach people who are currently enrolled in a place that they're already, many of them are already going to be going, um, that's why we picked Twitch. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and you can replace our intended audiences with like at Virginia Tech and all those situations. I think that's a pretty fair representation of us. But, and Alice, you can correct me if you don't think this is right, but I think we chose Twitch because that was where the audience for the type of content we were going to produce was. We knew that like live full-time role-playing games of like three-hour one-shots and stuff like that, like that, you went to Twitch to watch those. Uh, and maybe you caught a recording or a VOD or something on YouTube, but they were mostly live on on Twitch. And so we were hoping to tap into that audience and and be in the place where that audience was. And that was that was Twitch. Um, in addition to those other things with our other content, there was also a lot of the other content we'd hoped to produce, like just people making things um, is also on Twitch, like the maker channel on Twitch is pretty lively and you can just go watch someone make something and I mean you can watch those videos but they're on YouTube and these other places but they're usually much more produced they're the they're the edited version of the thing that went up on Twitch and you know we intend to try to do that too but the hope was that this would be a pretty low overhead situation editing videos and producing like professional content is a lot and you know this was an experiment to see how how this would go and so we try to always you know what's the lowest amount that we can do for an experiment because if it fails horribly then we don't want to have been like super invested in it and and have dumped a ton of hours on top of you know someone's normal job to get all that sort of stuff done yeah i think all of that is true i think uh, and also at the time like february 2020 um i may be a little wrong in this but youtube streaming was it, it, it existed but you know was not exactly what it is even now and even still i think there's a number of folks the sort of community elements that exist on twitch do not exist on um on youtube and especially you know um especially when we're, you know, reaching out to like Virginia Tech undergraduates and trying to sort of build some community there. I think that that is something that's of interest to us um, in comparison to some of the other platforms. Um, and, you know, I think that we definitely could, like we're, we are poised to be able to shift if we ever need to or would like to, um, you know, the technology we're using, the Epifan Pearl 2 to stream from, that we can stream to basically any platform should should our needs change should the content change um the only other kind of platform thing that we have talked about extensively and also would make sense for some of the certainly the tabletop oriented work and some of the talk back things is podcasting right so uh, spotify apple and like doing things in a podcasting format that's something that is an ongoing discussion at virginia tech and supporting podcasting generally um, is an ongoing discussion and like who hosts and what do you do there and getting the RSS feed set up and um, all of that is definitely in the works and we definitely want to have that happen for um, a number of our shows and you know I've been in contact with a number of people at the library um, through our publishing program um, to get that happening at some point so stay tuned for that so we will be you know expanding out that way as well. I think another thing too, and I, I think it was part of what I was told, and I don't know how much truth there is, was that the community on Twitch is a lot more supportive than like a place like YouTube. I mean, I think you can see that just in like how you interact. Like on Twitch, you come to the chat. On YouTube, you come to comment on things. Um, and I mean, YouTube comments are notorious as just being like 
you know, they say, if you're on YouTube, don't look at the comments. You're just going to be sad for like humanity and that sort of stuff. And, you know, hopefully we're making content that doesn't attract that sort of attention. But um, that sort of a thing is like Twitch. People are on Twitch because they want to come interact with somebody. Like that is why you go to Twitch versus going to one of these other platforms is that person is there doing the thing while you're there and that you can say something and they may respond to you. And that is, I mean, that is a goal is that we have that sort of direct interaction versus this, like you post something, people watch it later, they post a comment and you respond to it sort of thing. Yeah, and frog emojis. <laughs> yeah, no, that's definitely a component. And even like the YouTube live, like the way that chat runs from what I've seen. And again, I, I've seen it mostly on some like bigger streams with more people viewing. Um, it just is like a little bit more, you know, anonymous. There's generally less interaction and sometimes there's more or less, but it just seems not as set up for that interactivity, which is again, a key component of things that we're looking to do, especially for some of the maker streams like that, that needs to be a discussion. I mean, and it's been something we've done in the music stream too, as we think of like things that we're gonna feature and talk about during the stream, even if it's not a true workshop, it's been fun kind of saying like, okay, we're gonna do this and like explore these like elements today of a music production section. Um, so it's been a lot of fun. Um, kind of exploring that on Twitch and getting that interaction. Yeah. Well, we've just got a couple minutes left. Do we mm -hmm. want to skip and talk about um, what's next for each channel? Yeah. That sounds good. So I guess you first. have to go first, because I... Oh, I guess we do. <laughs> um, yeah, so... We are wrapping up with music streams here. I think we'll have a few more and then we'll take a small hiatus before we get the schedules set for the fall. Obviously, we're still waiting on a few things to get set in terms of location um, as we move to in-person, but I'm anticipating, I don't know if we have a full start date for role of play, um, but it will be moving to Mondays. We've had it on Fridays, so we'll have Monday night streams. Um, you know, I, we should have the Monday Night Football music play right now. <laughs> I hope you're um, going to have like a robot animation for each of the players as they, they join the game. That would be um, great. Uh, wow. Let's get Trevor on that. <laughs> yeah, Trevor, make these animations right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we'll be doing that. We'll have a music stream. We'll have the archive stream. Shortly after, we'll have the cocktails and, and fun things stream, cocktails and food stream. TV, TVD on the name specifically. Um, we'll continue to have um, Roll of Call, which is like the podcast response to the role of play. Um, and we're, we were considering, we have a graphic designer who's interested in potentially doing some like 3D animation work on stream and, and working alongside a, a novice and just sort of like building something and talking through like that sort of design at the same time. Uh, and then our prototyping studio is going to open sometime in the fall. Um, and at that point, we've got it set up to do a lot of makerspace sort of content and things like that. We're also hoping to start doing some of the exhibits uh, in the building as live events when they're openings. Um, we use we have usually some sort of like opening ceremony whenever we put up a new exhibit and I would love to see those start being live streamed because um, it's nice because there's usually the people who helped students, professors, whoever helped set up the exhibit, um, produce content for it or they're talking about what they did. And so you can come by later and you can look at the exhibits or you can see the collections online, but you miss out on this like very personal take if you weren't able to make it to the opening. So I'm hoping we can capture some of that if at all possible. Yeah, and we have like a mobile streaming beyond having our street major streaming setup able to move from room to room or we have some equipment that we will need to experiment with and hopefully with the exhibit openings that can do like mobile streaming um, and hopefully have someone walking around uh, streaming streaming live events. So that'll be a lot of fun. Or chaos, one of the two. Yeah, or both. 
I don't know. That's I don't know. Those two things are separate. <laughs> it's true. It's I mean, then it's guaranteed fun and guaranteed chaos, probably. That's probably true. That's probably the best way to put it. Mm-hmm. What about y'all? What do you guys have going? One of the big things we're doing. Um, sorry to jump in front of you, Claire. Uh, one of the big things we're doing is hiring a student specifically to be an assistant for the stream to help with uh, the administrative stuff and kind of routine stuff that we've been handling, Claire's been doing most of, um, things like when a guest wants to stream, walking them through, okay, what is OBS? How do you get onto Twitch? How do you use the kit that we give you? Um, what are some good streams for you to look at as examples? Stuff like that, that the student will hopefully be able to handle. Um, and then otherwise, I think I mentioned earlier, we're kind of changing the proportion of our uh, our core content. We're still going to be doing makerspace stuff, uh, digital media stuff, the state of sound streams, and our VR content. We're just going to be doing a little bit less of that, and we're going to be doing more uh, guest streams organized into mini series. I'd like to add an extra ES on there because it's fun. Um, they will be grouped. So we're, we have, for example, uh, state of exposure will be uh, photography mini series where um, Tim will come on and he'll walk through how to edit or how to um, bump up your colors or how to organize your photos or how to take good photos. And he'll run all of his streams and they'll be like, I don't know, um, it's actually every second Tuesday, but let's say it's every second Tuesday at 2 p.m. Um, and then we'll have some from our special collections and we'll have some from other groups and things like that. I think the other major thing for the fall, and um, Alice, you already talked about your, your streaming cart a little bit, which sounds great. Um, we're also going to have some physical, uh, a physical location to stream in, in, in the library. Um, so we have a small room that's going to be available for people to come in with all the equipment already set up that's, um, that should be, um, make it pretty easy for everybody to come in and just perform in the space and we can we can handle all that equipment stuff so which will be great for those series is um, that we're going to do in the fall it'll it'll be nice to have some people we can get them set up on the room and then they'll be ready to go they can bring whatever archival materials making materials um, got some good conversations like open science conversations and all of this stuff i think it'll be really fun Yeah, that right. sounds really Also, exciting. I think, also, I heard we we're going to play Mario Kart against y'all. <laughs> yeah. That's coming up in the Jonathan fall. Jonathan and I love oh, yeah. Mario Kart. Both of us are. We do play, we do play a lot of Mario Kart. That's I hope you're not, I, I hope you're as bad at it as I am. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not like I own great. Mario Kart Wii and a Wii that still works. So, like, I guess I'll start practicing. Wow. That's, that's the most recent one I've got. You got to get the training. Yeah, it's been, I will say it's been a while. Um, That's true. You know, it's been we a while. We used to stream just in our personal lives, um, a big group of friends, and Mario Kart was one of our common streams. Yeah, it always made us go to Baby Park, which everybody hates except for me. Um, no, Baby Park with all mushrooms on like 250 cc's is a lot of fun. It's so fun. Because you're going fun. way too fast to do anything. <laughs> It's so fun. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Baby, Sitting yeah, see. A tiny circle at 10,000 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so much fun. Uh, Y'all have to determine which, which CCs we're going to be going at. Because um, I'll have to remember how to do the highest ones. It's been a while. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, let's, can we, is 100, is that, is that okay to like be terrible? Because I'm really, I'm really just bad at it. <laughs> We you know, but then you get all the good power-ups too then, though, you know, get uh, those true. bullet bill just right to the front. We did uh, recently purchase a USB to Ethernet adapter for our mm -hmm. Switch for the streaming room so that we can actually do that. Because the few times that we've tried to do live streaming of um, Mario Kart, people have been unable to join our lobby. We've had inconsistent connection. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that this will help make things a little bit more routine. Also, at home, we got some pro controllers, so I'll pretend that oh, yeah. I have some mechanical advantage. I also have a pro controller. And I also have a pro controller. 
<laughs> at home, at home, we've had to use one of the USB C to Ethernet adapters because that's that's also been a problem. I think it's just a switch thing. It's always yeah. been if you go on the online thing, it's always a little shaky if you're on the yeah. Wi-Fi. Well, now their new their new console has Ethernet built into the yeah dock. I saw that. Yeah. Uh, it should be fun. I'm looking forward to yeah. it. Yeah, I'm excited. Awesome. I remember I remember we saw your stream pop up when uh it was like one of the first times we we found y'all and we started following you and I started getting messages about your stream whenever y'all go live. And I saw one time it was like we're playing Mario Kart and I was like well, now I want to play Mario Kart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll be I'm I'm very excited. Um I like playing Mario Kart and it's been a while. They need to release a new one also. Like, where is Mario Kart 9? It's it's time. It's kind of been time. And Mario Kart 8 came out on the Wii U. I know. I had it for the Wii U. Oh, well. That's my uh, next console to purchase, by the way, is the Wii U. Oh, I'm okay. determined to stay at least a generation or two behind. Just to keep them in order. That's yeah. Right. We have, we have a Wii U for lending. Uh, we have one available for lending as well as a Switch. You'd be surprised how much more often the Switch goes out than the Wii U. I wouldn't be surprised by that. I was going to say. I'm I was kidding. I was kidding. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. I think I, I, I would have to look at the numbers. I don't know how often the Wii U has gone out, but it is a um, probably countable on two hands numbers since we've been open for like two and a half years. That switch is like always gone. Always gone. <laughs> always gone. I'll remember we had um, a woman come in with like some children and they were like so excited to get it. They're like, we're going to get to borrow the switch. They were so excited. It reminded me of like myself at Blockbuster borrowing a gaming system and being being that kid, being like, we're going to get to borrow, you know, and then 64. <laughs> <laughs> Think of PlayStation tell, 2. That's how you get everybody's age is what they say <laughs> at the end of that sentence. It's almost yeah. for Nintendo. <laughs> and you said Nintendo yeah. 64, which is that's how you true. know Alice is younger than me. Not that much, you know. One console generation. <laughs> One console generation younger. <laughs> that's how we measure that. <laughs> right. Oh. Well, I think we've answered many of our questions. Uh, we've got some good things to look forward to, and we're definitely over time. So uh, unless there's any parting thoughts, perhaps we should close up. This was great. This is wonderful. To talk Love more to do it again. This. Yeah. Had a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, we'll see you soon uh, for me to lose some Mario Kart. It'll be great. <laughs> Hey, you know, I don't, you, who knows what will happen. Someone Anything has to can lose. happen in Mario Kart. Kart. I, I mean, Mario Kart's designed to never know you're going to win. True. Let's get hit by that blue turtle shell. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye.